with just a definition or with just a definition of a healthy organizational culture. Okay, okay, go to the second slide. All right. Growth is painful, change is painful, but nothing is as painful as staying stuck somewhere you don't belong. One of the most important things to growth is the recognition that you have outgrown. Okay, don't miss this. The most important piece to growth is that you first recognize you've outgrown. If you do not recognize that you've outgrown something, then what you end up doing is protecting a space that actually minimizes your capacity and weakens your, your ability to produce at a level that is honorable unto God based upon the season or the stage you're in. And I need everybody to understand that if you think that it's painful to grow, if you think that it's painful to change, the greatest, most painful place to be is where you accomplish nothing and you wake up one day and you are where you were, you, you are where you were when you started. You are where you were when you claimed that you wanted to be better and to do better because there's a process that comes. And so every growth season is triggered by a recognition that we still can. Wow. Every growth season is triggered by a recognition that it's still possible. Okay, next slide. The church that refuses to do the work to reach others is an enemy to Matthew 28, 19. It should be every one of your passion to see your church accomplish the will of God, to see your area accomplish the will of God. SP is St. Paul, and I did this for our leaders. And one of the things I tried to get them to understand is that the key to your church growing is driven by a compulsion to want to be better than you were the day before. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 is the Great Commission, and we should all be challenged to accomplish the things that God has created and called us to. Let's go to the next slide. So keys to growing your church through a ministry, through, through, through ministry leaders. Um, I, I made some corrections to this. And, and, so, and so I want to give you all a definition of organizational culture. And it's actually in the other PowerPoint that I sent him. But I want to give you a definition. Organizational culture is the collection of values expectations and practices that guide and inform all the actions of all of the team members. Organizational culture is the, is the collection of values, expectations, and practices. Values, your convictions, what do you believe? Expectations, your outcomes or your projected outcomes. Practices. The, the, the activity or the behavior in the organization tied to the expectations driven by values. Now, everybody get this. Values, expectations, and practices. Every organization has them, even if you don't identify. Now, now uh, Pastor, are these your leaders for, 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 for faith, for word of faith? Primarily, or oh, these are leaders from different churches. No, these are all from Word of Faith. Okay, so okay, go to what is organizational culture. This this is a piece I did for my for my class. Stop right there. Okay, everybody, get this. All of you are saying all of you are part of a church, right? All of you are part of the same ministry. Here's the question. What are the values, expectations, and practices that guide and inform the action of all of the team members? Now, when I say team members, I'm talking about everybody that is a part 
of the leadership system. Hear, hear, hear my language. And, and it's 10.08, so I don't want to be long. Everybody who's a part of the leadership system of Word of Faith, all of you are a part of the leadership system of Word of Faith. So what are the values? What are the beliefs? What are the expectations? And I'm not just talking about biblical or theological beliefs. I'm talking about the beliefs in terms of your understanding and your values of each other and how that successfully moves the organization forward. What are your expectations? What are your measurements, your metrics? What do you, what do you want to achieve as a ministry, as an organization? What do you want to accomplish in every ministry area? What are the expectations? And then what are the practices? Of course, communion, baptism, but what are your organizational practices? This is an organizational practice. This, this meeting right here, this gathering, this convening of leaders, and it guides everybody. No one gets to opt out of the values, expectations, and practices. No one gets to complain about it and maintain position in leadership. No one gets to work against it. No one gets to sabotage it. No one gets to be apathetic and maintain a position. No one gets to say, I can influence the organization by not fulfilling the values, expectations, and practices, which means, Pastor and Lady B, that there must be constant, consistent refinement of the values, expectations, and practices. Great companies, great cultures are the result of positive traits. And it leads to inspired, excellent performance, fulfillment of mission and vision, because productivity improves. Do not miss what I just said. When you have a great culture, it exemplifies positive traits. So what are the traits that Word of Faith wants to exemplify? What are the things that Word of Faith wants to accomplish and achieve? Okay, okay, let's go back to the next, to, to the other presentation. Okay. Now, I, I want everybody to get this because a lot of times ministry struggles because there's not a consistency in terms of performance of those who are given the responsibility of moving the vision and the mission forward. And because there's not clarity of strategic direction. Y'all still here? This is huge because. Nothing should be dying when there is visionary missional leadership in place. Nothing should be in a perpetual state of struggle when there is clear strategic direction. So one of the keys is developing a healthy culture. I just gave you a definition of culture whose foundation is biblical preaching and teaching and fervent prayer. I added something else to this because I actually I actually revised it a little. And, and biblical preaching and teaching, fervent prayer, and add to it, Lady B, a culture of congregational care. A healthy culture foundation is biblical preaching and teaching, fervent prayer, and congregational care. Congregational care, which is about meeting the needs of the partners or the members of the church, the organization, the company. Who are your customers? You all should be responsible about meeting the needs of the customer. Whether the customer is a member, whether the customer is the community, whether the customer is whoever. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time. This is essential then to cultivating disciples, partners, and your collective spiritual authority. Here's the second thing, building strong, consistent, effective ministries. Notice, no, no, notice the key words, strong, consistent, and effective ministries that nurture partners. I love this quote, culture does not change because we desire it to change. 
Culture changes when the organization is transformed. The culture reflects the reality of people working together every day. Oh, you got to get this. If you don't create a culture of working together, you can't build strong, consistent, effective ministries where the outcome is the nurture of the partners. When you nurture the people, you ultimately win the battle. Listen. Your greatest competition is not the church down the street. Your greatest competition is the standard of excellence you're called to achieve. And those things that seek to hinder the accomplishment, fulfillment, and transcendent accomplishment of that. Your greatest enemy is you and your performance. It's your attitude. It's your disposition. It's your commitment to building. That's your greatest enemy. Because you're not, you're not, you're not designed to be the other church. You're designed to be the best church you can be. Go to number three. Encourage volunteerism. You must nudge, nudge, N-U-D-G-E. You must nudge people into commitment. You know, I said this to a friend of mine. I said, I said, one of the challenges of the mega church ideal is that it doesn't give enough people opportunities to volunteer. And volunteerism is one of the important factors in spiritual transformation and formation. To be fully transformed and formed, and, 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 and to be fully transformed and to be fully formed in the image of Christ, I have to be a servant participating in the mission, vision, and strategic direction of my church. Okay, number four, creating and nurturing relationships within community through partnerships. Number five, developing a strong virtual church. I heard you guys talk about technology and using social media to promote your church. Six, hosting community-wide events. I heard something about Juneteenth. Hosting community-wide events for the public. Seven, focusing on small groups as a primary community building. Go to the next slide. Structuring for growth by making spirit-led right-time decisions. Philip Cosby, amazing quote. Slowness to change usually means fear of the new. I've discovered something really important. Most churches are not growing. And they're not growing, not because they can't grow. They're not growing because they're fearful to deconstruct for the sake of progress. They're not growing because they're not trying things that moves them to new and exciting spaces. That for a season makes it look uncertain. If you can't handle the uncertainty, you will never move towards the possibilities. If you can't handle the uncertainty, change will put you in a season of uncertainty. You can't handle the uncertainty, you will never move to the possibilities of a new season. Dennis O'Grady said, change has a bad reputation in our society, but it isn't bad at all, not by any means. In fact, change is necessary in life to keep us moving, keep us growing, keep us interested. Imagine life without change. It would be static, boring, and dull. Word of faith, what commitments are you making to change, to restructure, or to strengthen existing structure? Number nine, keep your building in good condition. And number 10, update your church information through the website. Okay, go to the next slide. So what do leaders do to assist and grow? Here's the first thing, be excited about your church. Be excited about your church. And let me tell you how you become excited about your church. You start getting some wins, right? I'm a baseball fan. I'm a baseball fan. Right now, the hottest story in baseball is the Cincinnati Reds. Cincinnati's won 12 straight games. 
they've got this young black guy, I think he's from the um, I think he's from the Caribbean, who is just electrifying the city, electrifying the major league. This guy is outrageously good. They had their first sellout in 22 years last night because they've won 12 games in a row and the city is excited, which means the city is no longer just excited about the Bengals. The city is now excited about the Cincinnati Reds because they've, they've gotten some wins. You've got to be excited about your church because that energy is transferable. That energy is transferable. But if you walk around complaining, if you walk around always in a, in a dull uh, posture, if you walk around uninterested in your church, yes, yes, exactly. That's a win. The season of baptism you guys are in, that's a win. Here's the next thing. Talk about the vision as if it's your idea. Leaders that talk about it like it's their idea will make a difference everywhere. Number three, support and encourage participation outside your ministry area. Support and encourage participation outside your ministry area, which means like I'm the dean of the Whit Practice School of Theology of Virginia Union. I'm the dean of the seminary, but I'm also working with other areas to see how I can encourage them to be successful. I need the undergraduate community to grow. I need, I need the other you know, master's programs to grow. That doesn't work against me. If you are part of Word of Faith, everything in Word of Faith needs to win. Everything in Word of Faith needs to grow. Everything in Word of Faith needs to thrive. And if there's a season where your area is not the primary area, you are still going to support the other areas because you understand that all of these work for the good of the organization. The next one, resolve issues by going the healthy route. Wow. Do not resolve issues by being petty and negative and nasty. Do not resolve issues by, by, by that old behavior, that old church behavior of huddling with two or three of your people and talking about the direction of the church and not doing the stuff you need to do to help it grow. Here's the next thing. Be excellent as a leader. Be excellent as a leader so your pastor will trust you. Next thing, give so you can be an example to others. Give, be a tither, be an over-the-top abundant giver so you can be an example to others. Be able to be the one that can be pointed to as an example of what you're trying to achieve through giving. And finally, be an unofficial adjutant to your pastor and your first lady. All of you need to be all in on the Bradfords. If you're not, you don't need to be a leader. You need to be all in. Let me see if there's another slide. I don't think so. Okay. 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 Take me down. Recently, and your pastor was there, it wasn't this week, it was the week before, we, I, 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 I am consecrating a, um, one of my sons in Kingdom Fellowship as bishop. He, he will become first presider of, our, he, he will become vice presider um, of the fellowship. And, and one of the first things that had to happen was his church had to buy in. Now, I don't, I don't know if, if you all can come off dark um, and maybe not, you may not be in a position you can come off dark, but I wanna say this to you and I need you to hear this. Until a church is all in on its leader or its leaders, it's gonna always have reasons to not grow and thrive until the church is all in on its leadership. Okay, I'll look at the ones who are all. Until the church is all in on its leadership. Brother Marcus, Brother Ronald, I don't know if you're ministers or not, so forgive me. Sister Keisha, here's what I need you to get. 
until Sister Thomas and you're all in on your leader. It ain't gonna work, Ronald. Bro, Ronald, you listening to me. It ain't gonna work, bro. It ain't gonna work, Marcus, until you watch this, because Sister Carrie, Sister Janet, Sister Rochelle, Brother Barrett, here's what happens. Churches that don't settle in to a leadership style will constantly be in conflict with itself. Y'all ain't in, listen, churches are not in conflict, Sister Cassandra, with anybody. Sister Ethel, it ain't in conflict with the church down the street. Churches are in conflict, Jeremiah 29, Brother Tyrone, Sister Janae, it's in conflict with itself. It's in conflict with itself. Let me push you. Pastor, let me push you. Successful ministries um, I, I want to pronounce the sister's name who begins with a V. So say your name for me. Vinique, like Monique. Girl, I like that name, Vinique. I've never met a Vinique. Lord have mercy. My life just got better. I can tell people I know a Vinique. They don't know of a need. I know of a need. Watch this. I close with this. I think I'm over my time. I close with this. Effective growing ministries are not the product singularly of the leader. Effective growing ministries is a collective collaborative effort of people who buy into something bigger than themselves. Ronald, who, who's your favorite, favorite sports team? Give me your give me your favorite sports team. Uh, the Washington Commanders. I knew you were gonna say that. Lord have mercy. I That's all right, yo. That's all good. I knew you were gonna say that. That's yeah. all right. He's not the only one. I know. I know where I am. I know what I'm talking to. I'm a Cowboys fan. I know. I know. Where I am. That's where we draw the line. What's cool? Yeah. What's cool? No. No. We don't even draw the line. We destroy the line there. But <laughs> but it's interesting. Washington has drafted some really good defensive players over the last couple of years. What they have not done well, what y'all have not done well, is figured out who your quarterback will be. And what your offense will look like. You got some decent skilled players, but you've never gotten it clear about that, about the leader of the offense. And everybody can't play quarterback. I hope y'all know I just went. Somebody's got to be skilled at the part of calling the plays and executing the offense. Brother Marcus, listen to me. Listen to me, y'all. You, when, when a church is committed to its leadership and the leadership is fully committed to the church, it becomes fun for everybody. Nothing is worse than having a leader who is miserable because that means that the culture does not. Vanique, is that right? Look at me. I know of Vanique. You better watch it. That means that new ideas die in these meetings. See, this can be a birthing room or a cemetery. This meeting right here can be a birthing room. Or Brother Ivan, it can be a cemetery. Brother Jet, Sister Janet, I see you chiming in. It can be the place where stuff comes to live, or it can be the place where stuff comes to die. And it doesn't even require you to disagree. You ain't got to say nothing, Brother Marcus. Here's how you kill it. Hey, hey, little person back there. Here's how you kill it. The moment Keisha vision is communicated, the shutdown happens. Watch this. You do this in the you, you do this in the spirit. You see what I just did? In the spirit, 
you do this. Now, you still here, but you do this. And what happens is, is people are stuck because they need your participation on the team. All right, okay. So your pastor, he's one of my dearest sons, him and, and you know, Lady Karen, um, you know, who really needs to come to seminary, but we'll talk about that later. Um, we'll talk about that another time. We're not gonna waste our time having that conversation. We, she know. Uh, her spiritual daddy is the dean and she ain't funny, but that's fine. I'm, I'm over it. I'm over it. No, I'm not. You can tell I'm not over it. So the Lord gave me this idea, Brother Ron. The Lord gave me this idea to create some called, well, now, honestly, the name came from your pastor, Summer of Salvation. The Lord gave me this idea. On the third Sunday in May, we baptized five people. Two of the people were young adults whose, whose father pushed them to be baptized. So Spirit of the Lord created this concept in my mind called catalyst. A catalyst actually came from the model of my mom. My mom was a woman who nudged her family to faith. That's the word the Lord gave me, nudged them. Pushed them to faith. My mom prayed for us. My mom, brother Marcus, sister Keisha, my mom stayed on top of us. And now most of us are in ministry, right? Well, here's the thing that was so profound. I want anybody to miss what you said. The Lord started showing me that our next wave of growth was going to come from people in the church encouraging family to be baptized. The Lord said, don't push them joining the church. Push baptism only. Now, you still do your invitation. But the invitation is not for the people being baptized. For the people being baptized is bringing them into faith alignment. So we started pushing this thing on. So the third Sunday, I stood up in the middle of the sermon and said, I want to, I listen, every Sunday we have candidates we're going to baptize until the first Sunday of September. And the goal, hear me, is 100 baptisms by the first Sunday of September, right? So Brother Ronald, we started this. This goal, 100, started with that five on the third Sunday. I started pushing this idea of the catalyst, which is now developed into a certification initiative. And the goal is to develop a 100 catalysts by the end of the year who will actually be engaged in the salvation and the baptism of their family member. So we started this. I announced it. 43 people signed up. We had 25 people. We had 23 people get baptized the next Sunday. Yeah. From the third Sunday in May, I'm over my time, until last Sunday, we baptized 58 people. Now, let me help you understand. Brother Marcus, we went months and didn't baptize. And when we did baptize, it was one or two people. Last week, we baptized 15 people. What's happening? Family members and friends. We have a 17-year-old young man who brought two of his best friends to be baptized. 17, and he brought two of his friends to be baptized. Can you imagine the energy in our church right now? And no, our giving has actually been up and down. So it hasn't hit the bottom line. But I'm having a meeting Thursday with my CFO, treasurer, and the pastor to tell him, if y'all gonna bug me about money, you clearly don't understand God. Because in this season, it's about baptism. If the doors get closed and we baptize 100 people, we won. Well, your pastor has taken on this. How many candidates do y'all have? We had officially a, a hundred names that came in. No one has signed up for this Sunday yet, but we start tomorrow. But we're going to have it open for those who come in the door. 
There you go. We had a young lady last week who joined the church and said, I want to get baptized. And they dressed her in five minutes and got her in the pool. Everybody, everybody, all 21 of y'all have got to buy into the sum of salvation. Everybody. Here's the first way you buy in. You bring your family. Do you have any kids that ain't baptized yet? Do you have any grandkids that ain't baptized? Do, do, do you have any nieces and nephews, siblings, parents that ain't baptized? Call them today. Be the first one to get them in the pool. See, see, see here's the key. None of this works if you don't work. Your pastor has bought into this summer of salvation. It's July. You got till September. Get on the phone today. Say, hey, hey, I want, I, I want you to get baptized. You nudge. I'm done. The key to church growth are ministry leaders, not always the pastor. The pastor is the catalyst for you but you're the catalyst of the vision. And I'm gonna tell y'all, when y'all start getting these wins, everybody's gonna feel your energy. Okay, I'm finished. Any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? You all have an excellent pastor. I'm biased, but you have an excellent pastor. And he has an amazing wife. She ain't been to seminary. She ain't come to union yet, but she's still an amazing daughter. 